This is Sarah Hines. When Sarah lost her job in Florida, she moved to Washington, D.C. to find work. Sarah, like many other conscientious Americans, became a member of the famed Occupy movement. Well, I'm living in a tent right now mainly because I want to be seen by Capitol Hill and the White House right at the end of the street. It's a constant reminder to the people who have to go back and forth and drive back and forth every day that there are tons of people who are discontent with how the country is being run right now. Like another victim of the lingering shockwave of America's seemingly unsolvable employment crisis, Mia Cunningham. Like for one position I looked at, I got a, a, a rejection letter, I guess you could say. And they said, well, thank you for applying. Um, in addition to you, 750 applicants also applied for this job. The situation has grown so dramatic, even the employed are feeling the pinch. In Dublin, Virginia, the hardworking union behind Volvo trucks engineered its own wage cut in order to protect its workforce. In 2011, our local union, 2069, we actually went through some concessions on our labor contract, which in retrospect let us recall all the laid off workers because we kind of leveled the playing field with other manufacturers along with our southern counterparts in Mexico, which was our biggest competition. This then are America's current options. Unemployment, or thanks to cuts, or the current slow motion of recovery, jobs with wages too low to sustain a healthy middle class. In Washington, in Nevada, in Virginia, and across the rest of the United States. But is it possible a full, sustainable recovery is closer than we think? Can a fundamental restructuring of the tax system be the straightforward change that will yield far-reaching results? What we have at present is that the national debt is a, a mortgage on labor because the income tax today is primarily a tax on labor income. And if you don't pay the tax, ultimately the penalty is to go to jail. So this turns every American child into an indentured servant at birth. We can change that by making it a mortgage on land instead. Most believe that the answer to America's woes begins here, or here, with offshore outsourcing to Mexico, India, or China. But the answer could very well be right here. Not under our very noses, but under our very feet. An innovative economic change, one that would reduce the taxes on labor and capital, reverse job shrinkage, and revitalize America. Taking just 50% of the rental value of land, by my estimation, would provide enough revenue to eliminate the personal income tax, the corporate income tax, and payroll taxes. This reform is the modernization of a solution first made popular by 19th century economist Henry George. Nature contributes fertile land, as well as minerals and resources like the radio spectrum used for cell phones. Society augments that pre-existing resource by establishing communities and adorning them with highways, schools, and other man-made amenities, thereby increasing the land's value. That same value is further increased by the growth of a workforce, producing the goods and services we all use. Together, these factors constitute the economic rent of land. Take California, a once prosperous state, now impoverished by tax policies favoring the proverbial 1%. Yet California has enough land, i.e. rental value, not only to eliminate all of its other taxes, but to raise all of the revenue required for state needs. The proposal that we're making is to replace the regressive taxes, those that hurt commerce and those that hurt production, with a more progressive tax. That tax would be a tax on the rental value of land. Land in California represents about 
three and a half trillion dollars of value. Fine for California, but does America generate enough rent to sustain such a radical reform? If, as might be expected, the government wants to balance the books, you can eliminate the deficit by collecting yet more of the rental value of land. And if you want to pay down the debt, there's money for that as well. It's a solution with high profile champions from the right and left, including economist Milton Friedman, who said, in my opinion, the least bad tax is the property tax on the unimproved value of land. The Henry George argument of many, many years ago and recent Nobel Prize recipient, Joseph Stiglitz. In his book, The Price of Inequality, Stiglitz writes, a stiff tax on all such rents would not only reduce inequality, but also reduce incentives to engage in the kind of rent-seeking activities that distort our economy and our democracy. Radical as this idea may seem, it's an idea that's been put into effect before. In the 1830s, President Andrew Jackson sold off federal land and was thereby able to eliminate the national debt. In the 1920s, Secretary of the Treasury Andrew Mellon paid the debt down substantially using income tax to extract rent from the land. The problem? In both cases, the collected tax was distributed to state and city governments who sunk it into costly public works without continuing to collect, for many years thereafter, the economic rent these works generated. The benefits of these large public infrastructure programs were effectively privatized. In both cases, this triggered an historic real estate boom and an historic crash with periodic crashes continuing to this day. This is especially evident in Las Vegas, where the biggest gamble of all may not be at the slot machines, but upon solid ground. Houses like this, for example, once sold for $600,000. Today, their value is but a third of that, fallen like the fortunes of the surrounding hotels and gaming businesses, all closed due to political arrogance that perpetually builds up and tears down America. Hence, an unprecedented acreage of potentially revenue-generating land, completely out of use in places as diverse as Vegas, California's Orange County, and Washington, D.C., where another form of land abuse is found. To our right, you can see acres and acres of parking. A mere few blocks from the U.S. Capitol Acres that should be providing employment for people, not parking for cars. The way to avoid this problem is for the public sector to recapture and recycle the land values that it creates itself. By doing this, they mandate that, that public land or land that's well served by public goods and services gets put into use according to the value of that land. Landowners would pay in proportion to the benefits they receive as reflected by higher land values. So the higher the land value, the more they'd pay. The higher the land value, the more benefit they're receiving from the public. So that's both understandable and fair. But no road is peril free. Take the speed bump of land speculation. When this happens with land, land gets into the hands of people who wildly overestimate how rapidly it will rise in value, and therefore how important it is not to use it now, but to save it for later when everyone else will realize how valuable it is. It is this winner's curse that permits prime real estate from one and two story buildings in downtown areas to newly built condos in good locations to sit dilapidated or empty for generations, a telltale example of inefficient land use. And the proof of the pudding is that uh, all of the income property in the United States, which is worth trillions of dollars on the market, is apparently being run as a great charity, according to professors Hudson and Feder, who have discovered by analyzing the income accounts that all this property 
uh, reports taxable income of zero. I repeat, zero from trillions of dollars worth of uh, taxable property. This is uh, the result of successful accounting trickery. The failure to first raise public revenue from land and natural resource rents has forced reliance on increasingly higher income and consumption taxes. These taxes inhibit the growth of small and medium-sized businesses. How many more jobs, one has to ask, might have been created if their revenue had been extracted from the land instead of wages and sales? This capital ought to be invested in small and medium-sized businesses, as well as a few big businesses like the motor companies, whose capital turns over fast. But basically, the important thing is to get it rotating, revolving if you prefer. That's the key to making jobs. The resulting creation of employment, not to mention the collective boon to spending, would aggressively counter the lack of effective demand in the current American labor market. And politicians keep offering the same old choices. Higher taxes or cuts to public services. Mere changes in public finance policy, along with innovation and technological change, will not create a third all-saving industrial revolution. And while America may well recover, if by the same means, then with the same eventual result. The next crisis is going to be worse than the crash of 2008, because in 2008 and now, the U.S. government still has good credit. They can borrow money on cheap terms. But when the federal debt is several times higher, as we have deficits of over a trillion dollars a year, plus unfunded liabilities for Social Security and Medicare, the next crisis will be much worse than the recent one because the United States government will be all tapped out. They won't be able to borrow money anymore. U.S. Treasury bonds will be considered risky. So dire is the situation that inertia has become the biggest risk of all. How then to get America off this fragile life support and to end this vicious cycle? Needed public revenue should first be raised from land and natural resources before taxes are appropriated from people's employment. Often, it is helpful to look to the past in order to articulate an economic philosophy for the future. Hence, the practical, constructive wisdom of Henry George. Let people pay for what they receive and keep what they create. The result, a fully employed America on solid ground.